Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, uh, on this second Sunday of Lent, uh, I would like to think a little bit with you about the Gospel of John. Christ Jesus uh, is, as we know, named the Prince of Peace, is recognized as a person of peace by many leaders throughout history. Uh, we might immediately have some names like Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi come to mind, as well as many theologians uh, who have looked to Jesus as an incarnation of God's peace and love in the world. Jesus appears in Scripture in God's story to suggest even a peace-filled engagement uh, with the powers of this world, with authorities and religious leaders of his day. He teaches to turn the other cheek, put away the sword, and early Christians in following Jesus believe that Christ was peaceful, and so they even refused to wear a, a belt like military, uh, military pieces of clothing included, and many civilians, uh, people not a part of the military, embraced. The driving out of the money changers in the temple seems to be behavior that is quite the opposite of this idea of Christ as peace bearer, shalom bearer, blessing bearer. Uh, it appears almost like an act of uh, violence, uh, through Je though, though Jesus has repeatedly suggested to his followers that they are to be different in the world, more like citizens of the kingdom of God. I would suggest that part of the problem is we don't see God's narrative for what it is, for how it fits in the great arc of uh, God's story and invitation to us regarding the engagement with powers and authorities which often use violence for pacification, but not peace for obedience uh, and not discipleship. I believe when we read this passage, we miss the challenge of uh, following Jesus. Uh, we miss what's actually happening of Christ's invitation to us to pick up our cross in our own lives and in the lives of our families and friends and neighborhoods. Uh, and I'm leaning here on the work uh, and writing of Shane Claiborne, Stanley Hauerwas, and John Deere, several theologians uh, of peace uh, and nonviolence. John Deere points out that Jesus was a revolutionary, but a nonviolent revolutionary. Jesus was, I still believe, nonviolent, but was not passive. And here is a distinction that's important for us to make as we read this passage. Jesus was active and oftentimes confrontational. Uh, uh, even the Palm Sunday event is an action, an intentional uh, action and not a passive one. The cleansing of the temple is one of four passages that is shared by all of the Gospels, uh, similar to the feeding of the 5,000. And the whip is only used in John's Gospel, and I want to come back to that later. The other three seem to reveal an active engagement like uh, John's, but uh, Jesus confronts the powers staged in the temple, and he does so without harm to anyone. John Deere writes, as anyone who has engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience knows, this is a classic example of symbolic nonviolent but direct action. Let me offer a picture of the context so that we may see and understand a little bit more about what's happening as Jesus enters the temple in these actions of protest. The religious citizens of his day were expected to visit God in the temple each year, every Passover. In fact, the population would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They would pay an immense fee to enter the temple itself. 
and over 18,000 lambs would be purchased for holy sacrifice in the temple and expensive doves were sold. A heavy tax was charged for any and all of these these bits and pieces of religious action. And so because people came from uh, around the country, uh, there was a need for a unified currency. So the religious space itself uh, uh, had these money changers, individuals operate a lot like uh, like banks peddling loans, tracking debts uh, for these unclean sinners so that they could pay uh, a holy temple fee. Special fees were added, of course, to the changing of, the, of uh, uh, these coins, uh, all of which was most especially a burden for the poor. We must remember that the demonic and evil always stalks the good. Even our best efforts of doing good can harm or twist relationships. I can imagine nobody expected when they started out to solve some of these problems and provide the sacrifices and exchange the money that it would end up where it was. Yet Jesus chooses to engage the religious and political powers of the day, and he does so pointing out how destructive this system is. Not, not for a more just system of monetizing uh, worship for the poor, but Jesus is saying this whole uh, enterprise must be turned on its head. Jesus is being an activist. He's engaging the powers, not harming anyone, but engaging in a very direct and physical way the powers that have created this economic benefit around the worship of God. He drives out thousands and thousands of animals. It says he drives them all out uh, with a lash, uh, a whip in John's gospel. He does not drive out the people with the whip. Uh, uh, the gospel is particular. He also turns over the tables. We might even know that Jesus goes to the worship site in one of the gospel accounts at Temple Mount uh, with all the money changes there, leaves and returns is suggesting an intentional engagement with the evil and demonic that has gathered around. Not Jesus. This is not a picture of Jesus being angry or losing his temper as portrayed in some of the film versions of the event. Instead, Jesus is being revealed to us as a righteous prophet, God's vision of our prophetic work, the prophetic work of God's people. We might consider how other prophets have engaged the world. Prophets like Moses and Elijah and Elijah and Hosea and Micah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Each of these prophets confronts in an active way the powers of this world. You see, it turns out that, that God has a fondness for people and seeks their betterment, their improvement, their societal good, so that it reflects ever more God's imagined society of how we're to live together. James Cone wrote in, in his book, uh, The God of the Oppressed, the scandal of the gospel means liberation, that this liberation comes to the poor and that it gives them the strength and courage to break the conditions of servitude. God, you see, is not a disinterested party, but God's solidarity energizes free people and seeks for them to engage the oppressive powers around them. This was Jesus' work in the, in the mount on that day to free the people from religious profiteering to a more direct, unmediated worship of God. We might be curious where is this place, this mount, this uh, 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 space of, uh, that needs to be cleansed in our own lives? Where is it that we inhabit that we need Jesus to come in and join with us in solidarity? Which parts need to be cleaned out? We might turn first to think of this as an analogy for ourselves, for our souls, for our bodies, uh, in this Lenten season, where do I need to be clean, dusted out? Where does my faith and my life, my health, my well-being, my prayer life and spiritual life need to be changed and transformed 
the ter tables turned in this moment of Lent, where, uh, where have I turned my faith into an exchange system where if I'm good, God will love me, and how do I begin to receive the grace of God to see that God wishes a very direct relationship and pours God's self out for me. But we also want to see that this action of Jesus invites us to look outward. Uh, where, I, uh, where have I turned relationships in my life into agreements and super, superficial arrangements about pleasing each other? Uh, uh, if you give me what I want, I'll give you what you want. Make me happy or I will leave. How have we created exchange systems in relationships uh, rather than living into the grace of God uh, and the love of God flowing through us to each other? We might even look then, uh, as we think of Jesus' interaction and action on this day, where in the world do we see profiteering and oppression and the powers taking advantage of systems where are the people in need of voices and solidarity and others who, who need us to, to care with them for the world in which they find themselves? Where might we be supportive and be advocates? Where might we stop being passive but instead help to reform uh, and engage in a world so that uh, as my friend uh, Archbishop Tabo says, that tomorrow might be different than today. Uh, I would say that tomorrow might be more like God's imagined kingdom uh, than we see around us today. You see, what I've learned from this passage in John is that Christians cannot be free from this world, free from the sorrow and pain. Christians cannot be estranged from their families and friends and congregation and even their neighborhood. We cannot look at each other in person when we're together or on Zoom and refuse to see each other's pain and sorrow, but also to refuse to see victories and joy that we share with one another. We are not free of this world as Christians or as a church, nor are we free in a time from a time and from sorrow. And I'm riffing here a little bit on, on poet and author Wendell Berry's uh, work. Uh, we're, we're not created, you see, to be alone or to be removed from one another. We are instead, if you will, wedded to each other in the uh, temple of our Christian communities, just as you and I individually are wedded to Christ. Uh, we are given to one another. And our passage today in John's gospel invites us to open our eyes and to see the opportunity for the cleansing of ourselves and the world around us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.